What makes an anaesthetist decide to make an online course, put their head in front of a camera and make themselves insta-famous? Well, hello there, listeners. It's Susie New from the Australian Society of Anaesthetists, and thank you for listening to our podcast. It's called Australian Anaesthesia, and it's where we talk about all things relevant to anaesthesia in Australia. In this episode, I am chatting with Dr. Jack Madden, a humble member of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists who did just that. He is the founder of Periop Concepts, which helps new anaesthetic nurses and doctors too, I might add, find their way around providing safe anaesthesia. It's all about building knowledge and improving safety. I am proud to say that Periop Concepts has been endorsed by the Australian Society of Anaesthetists because we too stand for building knowledge and improving safety. For our nursing colleagues, it has been accredited by the Australian College of Nursing and the Australian College of Perianesthesia Nurses. So lots of good backing there. Jack and I chat about the courses that are provided along with the other very practical educational resources. We also spend some time talking about how he has been sharing this resource with our colleagues in low and middle income countries. He really is a good egg. All right, let's get into it. How are you? I'm good. How are you? It's nice to see you again. It's great to see you again. I feel like I've seen you because I've been listening to the podcast and hear your voice all the time. It's actually quite daunting because all your guests sound so good. Uh, Trust me, I will make you sound this good as well. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully, with a bit of editing. (laughs) I'm big on editing, actually. I'm not surprised. Everyone's got a different philosophy. I know some people just put up their raw audio, but I figure my audience are people a bit like me, professionals, busy probably doing something else whilst they're listening to the podcast, driving or doing a bit of housework. And I figure I don't want to waste their time. Yeah. I have the same approach with our lessons in our courses. We make them the opposite of that kind of recorded PowerPoint presentation. It's just condensed 10 minute, only what you need. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's an art, isn't it? And something to keep working on. But let's dive into, or before we dive into that more, let's just find out a bit more about you. Where are you at in life? So I live in Hobart. Normally I have a half and half public and private appointment and I'm currently on a two year parental leave from the public. So it's just like an unpaid parental leave. So I can spend some time with my son, which has been great. My life is very simple with one system. Um, And I work three days at the moment and spend a fair bit of time on this education side of things. My wife just thinks I'm an absolute idiot for taking this on at the time that I took it on. (laughs) (laughs) But she's been very supportive. When Um, did you take it on? I literally started recording lessons, I think just after he was born. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, And I initially thought that I would have a lot of time because he'd be sleeping and I'd be at home. And then very quickly that sleep becomes daytime, awake time. But I think we get the balance back now. You Um, won't be the first person who's been a bit ambitious with what they can achieve with a newborn. What about you? Yeah, good. Similar. Our daughter's now seven. But I think a bit like you, when she was born, I thought, great, I've got six months off work. They only need to eat every three or four hours. And there's another sort of two and a half hours in between feeds that you can do stuff. Yeah, no. (laughs) No, no, (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Are you sharing the parenting? Yeah, Anna's gone back to work a couple of days a week. But I think if you ask me, I say, yep, we're sharing the parenting. (laughs) If you ask Anna, she'll be like, we could be sharing it more. but (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I just look at parenting at this age as like it's a tank of water that you've got to fill out with mini drips and I don't think I can work hard now and then expect him to relate to me if I've got an empty tank like in two years time or something like that so Mm. but no the balance with work is good I get a pretty good scope of practice I've got heaps of peds A&T a bit of neuro a bit of ortho a bit of eyes and scopes with friends and I really enjoy it it's good I'm trying to defend that balance which is it's hard but it's worth it I think so We are getting together to talk about your education project that you've been working on, Periop Concepts, which looks fantastic, I've got to say, from what I've seen on on Instagram. But for people who are listening, tell us what it is exactly. So Periop Concepts is an Australian online education provider for hospitals and perioperative nurses. So we are proudly the only Australian provider of online education that is accredited by ACPAN, the Australian College of Perianesthetic Nurses. Our motto is to build knowledge and improve safety. And our mission is to improve safety by improving access to effective education for perioperative nurses in Australia and around the world. So your target group are the periop nurses? Yes, and I guess specifically at this point is anaesthetic nurses. And how long has periop concepts been up and running? 
it's about a year now Mm -hmm. and that's but really the last three months is when most of the traction has taken place and what sort of offerings do you provide We provide education through three main avenues. The main one is the anaesthetic assistant starter course. It's a 100% online course which aims to give new anaesthetic nurses a way of achieving a safe knowledge base in a matter of a couple of weeks through online lessons and assessments. And it covers five main topics. So the first one is about how to adjust to the environment of the operating theatre. Mm-hmm. And so I think we take for granted how scary that is when you first enter an operating theatre because it was so long ago for us. But for someone who's been in nursing for several weeks, it's a really scary place. So we look at things like hazards like sharps or occupational exposure or heavy lifting and radiation. And we look at the anaesthetic triangle, which is a very oh, important part I of the I say that <laughs> every time as a medical student standing there looking frozen, where do I stand? I love the anaesthetic triangle. And most people are surprised to hear it, actually, so hopefully it sinks in. And then it talks about communication in the operating theatre as part of a team, talks about vigilance, and then a little bit on patient-centred care and how a patient's day of surgery is a very vulnerable and scary one for them. So that's lesson one. Lesson two is about the anaesthetist, and it gives the learner a simple method of extracting a plan for your list and then talks about the dangers of authority gradients in the operating theatre and how that can impact teamwork negatively. The third lesson's on monitoring. Nurses are really good at applying monitoring and that side of things, but this lesson aims to give the learner a framework for being able to look at the monitor and know whether the patient is safe very quickly. So it covers the four ANSCA standard monitors of pulse oximetry, non-invasive blood pressure, ECG, and capnography. Looks at normal ranges, sources of error, and how to interpret the data, and then putting that together, being able to look at the screen when the anaesthetist is ducked out of the room or something like that, and knowing whether the patient's safe. Uh, Then drugs is the fourth lesson. It basically categorizes all the drugs that they see in the trolley into six main categories and gives them an easy framework to remember that, including the anaesthetic triad of sedation, muscle relaxation, analgesia, and a few other categories. And then importantly, nurses play such an important role in preventing drug errors. And this lesson talks about the anaesthetic assistant's role in anticipating and preventing them and also the common ways they happen. And there's 10 rules that we've provided for the anaesthetic assistant to try and minimise drug errors. And then the final lesson, which I think is my favourite one, is the topic is preparing for takeoff. And so there's two parts. One provides a comprehensive checklist for the assistant to perform just before you start each case to make sure you've got everything ready and anticipating problems. And then the second part is using the vortex approach to give them a method of just anticipating what to do if the first plan A of airway management doesn't work. So they're all 10-minute lessons. They've got an assessment after each lesson and then there's an attached document for them to work through after that. So that's the Anaesthetic Assistant Starter Course. Just in terms of that course, do they work through it at their own pace and it's all online or is there any sort of interaction with a facilitator or a tutor or someone like that? So the course is it's a drip fed method. So once you sign up, there's a lesson every five days, basically. And the intention there is each lesson has a, a guidance for learning by experience. So there's a bunch of things for them to go and do in the operating theater that week. So I think just giving all the lessons at once, I think wouldn't have the same effect. So the learner can access that anytime they like, but it's drip fed over about a month. Each 10 minute lesson, you said every five days, and then it takes about a month to get it all rolled out. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And then with the assessment, is that all done online and you get automatic feedback or does that come back to you or someone else to go through and correct everything? So I look at all the assessments. They're automatically graded at the time and then every time it comes through, I'll look at them. Most of them, thankfully, are passes. But if there's someone who's had several attempts or someone who's struggling with those assessments, then I'll contact them and just see if they need any more help. In the setting of a hospital package, we'd be contacting the educators about engagement and just also finding out if they had any concerns about their learners, but also if we're identifying that someone's either not doing the course or someone is struggling with the answers, then we'll try and work out a plan to help them by contacting them individually. So people can sign up to do this course as an individual or you're also working through hospitals to get it rolled out to all of the post-grad or other nurses who are interested in upskilling in anaesthesia? 
That's right. So there's two ways that learners can access it. The most common way is that individuals will go through our website and sign up that way, and that gives them direct access to it. The hospital package, the educators will give us a list of learners that they want to go through the course, and then we'll provide them direct access and do the same. So we have the same oversight regardless and and ability to follow up, but they're the two methods. And we like for the learners, for the hospital to be able to cover it for them because that seems to be a more appropriate method. So you mean if there's a nurse educator, they're involved in supervising the nurses that they're training? We try and keep in contact with those educators as much as possible. It's definitely not replacing an educator. We like to think that the hospitals are paying for the course for the learners is what I was saying. Because, you know, a nurse in their first few weeks, they already have enough things thrown at them. I think that having a hospital enter into a comprehensive program for them, I think is a nice way to do it. The hospital package is slightly different because we provide the hospitals with regular online teaching sessions as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bit more value in there for them. I see. So they're getting some tutorials as well. That's right. Yeah. And we phrase it as lifetime access. So you sign up and then you have access to all our future sessions that we do in terms Mm -hmm. of live sessions and that sort of thing. And you've got access to the content ongoing. I think that provides them some value. Yeah. And the live sessions I take it are truly live. So there's an opportunity for interaction. That's right. So we started those last month, actually. I said there were several avenues we provide education. One was the course. The second one is the live Zoom sessions. And so we advertise through Instagram and through our email list. And last month we did one on using the Vortex approach for the anesthetic assistant to anticipate difficult airways and how to manage them. I expected just to, to turn up with about 10 people or something like that. And we had over 100 people registered. Oh, fantastic. Good work. We ran it as a Zoom webinar. So there's no camera for the learners, but we do live polls along the way and there's a chat box where we have a moderator and we have opportunities for questions along the way and so it's quite interactive and then we take a recording of it and keep it on our website for people to go back and do. Wow, gosh, lots of work. And then you said there was a third avenue that you're providing education. Yeah, so the third thing is the handbook. So the anaesthetic assistant handbook is is a, I guess the reason it started was I see so many nurses carrying around these little notebooks in theatre and writing down all the anaesthetist quirks and preferences and that sort of thing. And so I thought, why not add some of our content into that book? And so it's a 100-page book that's the size of a scrub pocket and one third of it has infographics of all the things we talk about in the course, all the checklists and stuff to do with airway management or machine checks and that sort of thing. And then one third of it is just space for notes to write during the course or whatever you want to write in. And then the other third is to write anaesthetist preferences. And that's been really popular. Very practical. <laughs> it's been so popular that I've had to develop a fulfillment center in my car. So <laughs> I've got a stack of books and a bunch of envelopes and stamps and every day I get a couple of orders and I'll stop on the way home and write the envelope out and post it. <laughs> and I didn't send myself doing that a couple of years ago. The work of an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, it's quite pleasing because a lot of the orders are coming from educators. Great. And they see there must be, I guess, a gap there. And can people go and look at the website and look at an example of the book? Yeah, that's right. So there's a, I guess, a website has a store page and there's a good summary of what's there. And on our Instagram page, I'm not sure if you've seen any of the reels about it, but there's a couple of reels that kind of flick through all the pages in it and explain what's in it. And so the website looks like the best way to learn more about Periop Concepts as well as Instagram. Would that be your sort of two main channels at the moment? Yeah, we do have a Facebook page, which is not as advanced as the Instagram one is for, for sharing information at the moment. But periopconcepts.com is our website. It's a pretty straightforward website to work through that provides everything that people would want and for educators there's a page there it just says for educators or forward slash educators and that gives all the information about the hospital package and the course itself the instagram um, account i'm really proud of the instagram account but it's only because i've brought on a, a friend and colleague in andrew goyan who's He's a registered nurse who is also a bit of an entrepreneur and has amazing marketing skills. And Instagram is amazing. It's a really beautiful page. (laughs) He's done a great job. We try and make the Instagram page 30% fun, 30% educational and 30%, maybe 20% about what our products involve. And Mm. we don't want to be turning people off by making it too salesy. So we try and keep it fun, reminding everyone that nurses are amazing and Mm. good anesthetic nurses are the best thing ever and that also the don't take things too seriously, but also here's some education or resources that you may not find anywhere else. And just little snippets of things like, what do you do when you have a difficult art line? Or how do you help prepare for that? Or what would be your second plan today if you had a failed airway? And there's some great engagement there as well. That sounds amazing. Can I ask, what gave you the idea for coming up with Periop Concepts? 
I think it started about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. I went to work to do a sick laparotomy and I said to the nurse, I want to do a rapid sequence. And the nurse said back to me, I'm sorry, I don't know what a rapid oh, sequence is. We've all been there. Your heart just sinks. And your heart sinks, yeah. And I said, how long have you been doing anesthetic nursing? And they said, about four weeks. And this nurse was mm. considered independent. So I I went and did a bit of digging about what the scenario is at the moment and I never thought there was a real problem. But then if you look at PSO8, the ANSCA standards for the assistant to the anaesthetist, that says that anaesthetic nurses should have 12 months of supervised practice in anaesthetic and anaesthetic nursing prior to independent practice. And my research has found that the reality is around three to six weeks is about oh, what most are getting at the moment. That is what it feels like anecdotally. I can 100% agree with that. And so I looked at why, and I've come to two reasons. And one is that since COVID, there's been serious resource scarcity in education. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, unfortunately, an exodus of senior staff that's happened in the last few years as well has taken a whole lot of corporate knowledge and enthusiasm for teaching. And so it's left us with a system that's not really doing the right thing by these new anaesthetic nurses. It's mm -hmm. not their fault. It's that the resources aren't there and that the drive to teach or the ability to have longer periods of supervision is just not feasible for some hospitals. I should mention that none of this is a criticism of anaesthetic nurses. I think we work with amazing anaesthetic mm. nurses every day and perioperative nurses, and Australia has some of the, the highest standards of anaesthetic nursing. I think where the problem is a system issue, which is not helping the new entrance to the system currently. Agreed. I think it's also a testament to how great the nurses are that yep. you work with, that when you meet someone who's only been on the job for three or four weeks, you can really see a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And we did it for five or six years before we started feeling competent at it. And you see these really competent nurses who pick it up in a matter of weeks to months. Yeah. So that gave me the kind of idea. I've always liked education. I did a grad cert in clinical education during my fellowship and I've run educational sessions with nurses since I came back to Hobart in 2017. But it just got to the point where I was getting asked every week to do a session and I thought, why not put this into an online format Yeah. and then everyone can access it and I can say, yeah, here you go. Or you can all join the Zoom session next month and we can do five hospitals at once or more. Exactly. So then I taught myself how to do things that I have never done before, make an online course, put my head in front of a camera, make a reel, make an Instagram page. I wasn't on social media, so that was all new. Yeah, you've learned quickly and you're doing a great job. I think a lot of that's thanks to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so also using the resources around you, finding great people to join your team. Some of these things that we talked about, I also get asked a lot about by junior doctors. Do you think that if there are people listening out there who are junior doctors who really want to do this course, do you think that it's appropriate for them to do. I do. And I think that after a, a, a bit of time, I realized I mislabeled it in that Andrew actually lives with a couple of medical students and they've been looking at the content. They said, this is just what we need. Because I was thinking anesthetic registrars don't need any more resources. It's a really well-resourced program and that there's enough resources out there. But I hadn't thought of the medical students in that respect. They come for a few weeks and then we don't see them again. Whereas we work with anaesthetic nurses one-on-one -on -one every day, so it's in your mind. But if you're a medical student about to do a placement in theatre or in anaesthetics, this would be perfect. And our course that's currently under construction, it's called the Nurse Cannulation Course, with a short course on safe and effective cannulation. But then I realised that actually is perfect for a medical student learning how to cannulate as well. Yeah, so. and interns and residents and <laughs> yep. lots of people, yeah. So have you had much interest from the medical students or junior doctor group? No, not yet, but I guess we haven't really looked. I really wanted to make sure we kept our focus small to start with and just try and make a good product that's targeted early. And I think that might be something we think about down the track once we feel like we're getting what we want in terms of the quality and the outcome. Well, look, it's a great product. It's a great concept. And I think you're just executing it so well. So I really do wish you all the best of luck with it. Thank you. I appreciate the support, Susie. Yeah, no worries. Oh, the other thing was, that's right. So you're getting some traction with people in overseas countries, particularly low and middle income countries. So, well, with Namibia so far. Namibia, yeah. So it's always been something we wanted the business to have was a global outreach component to it. And it's perfect because it's online. And so anyone with an internet connection who speaks English can view the course and get something out of it. So I contacted Andrew Ottaway, who's had a long track record with Global Outreach in Namibia and said, 
what's the situation for anesthetic nurses in Namibia? Do they have anesthetic assistance? He said, yep, they're nurses. And I said, would they benefit from some education? And he said, definitely. So he was able to give me a network of educators in, I think, a few different hospitals. And so we provided the course for free just with a link and a code, basically. And it was amazing. There were 60 people, 60 Namibians did the course within a few weeks. And there was some amazing engagement. They were so happy with it. Oh, they're so desperate for education, I found. some Not the Namibians in particular, but lots of people from low middle income countries. Yeah. And so that was great. I think we'll keep that going and right. hopefully we have opportunities to do the same in other areas because we don't need to do much to transport the course. It's just an online course. That's great. Harnessing the power of online education. Well done. You've totally captured, which is one of the reasons I started doing a podcast, is totally captured the efficiency of just recording it. You're reaching people like in Namibia and people who may not have access wherever they are in Australia, which is so effective. So yeah, so I brought it up with ODEC and it's interesting because ODEC reaches so many countries, Myanmar, Mongolia, Cambodia, Fiji, Micronesia, so forth. One of the interesting things, and it's really interesting that it came up automatically in Namibia, is that they've already got anaesthetic assistance yeah. and some sort of educators for them. So it's interesting in some of the countries where ODEC goes into, there is no dedicated anaesthetic assistant role. Is there anyone in that role or is it just the anaesthetist flying solo? Yeah, so in some of the countries I've worked in, it's the anaesthetist flying solo. I've worked in places where there's only anaesthetic nurses and so they assist each other. One will be the main independent anaesthetist. It makes it really easy for handover to recovery, actually, because if you hand it over to recovery to another anaesthetist, you can just guarantee certain things would happen. So it actually was really efficient, but probably you know, not as cost effective. The In one country that I have visited, the assistant was an orderly. Okay. And there was no career structure for them. So they went to collect the patients from the ward, pass you the tube, go back. And so it was interesting how this opened up a little bit of a political discussion about it's great to train them, but it's also important to support them in a career structure. No, you're about to say something, sorry. Well, no, in Hobart, we've got a relationship with the Antarctic Division and mm-hmm. uh, and we often have tradespeople coming through who need to learn how to assist the anaesthetist when they go to Antarctica. And it's actually a really fun process, working out what someone knows and what their line of work is and then trying to give them a very broad picture on how to manage an, an anaesthetic, basically. Mm. Obviously not the intubation or vascular access part because the person performing the surgery will do both of those. Mm. But you can still get across quite a lot of principles quite effectively, I think, you know, in someone who hasn't done any healthcare work at all. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm not sure I'd, that I'd want that to be the norm. but Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few schools of thought, isn't there? I think no matter who is in the theatre, the more skills, the better is where I sit. So I have often been guilty and it's upset some of the people in the theatre, for letting the tech pre-oxygenate a patient, for example. Okay. But I think, again, the more people who know what we have to do and what we're thinking about and have got a bit of a skill for it, because techs can be also doing first aid courses for their local footy club or something and all of a sudden finding themselves doing BLS on the side of the ground or whatever. So I, I think that the more skills, the better is one philosophy. When you say tech, you're talking about theatre support officers or anaesthetic techs? Uh, theatre support officers, yeah, so yeah. the people who come and mop the floors. Yes, gotcha, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, that improves the shared mental model. I think the more people in the room who know what everyone else's role is, that just optimises teamwork. I think that's Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like we love it when we see a surgeon mop the floor too, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And see a, the orderly intubate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been told off though for allowing the orderly to bag mass ventilate someone. So it can ruffle a few feathers. Bit of controversy, love that in a podcast. <laughs> but, um, the bigger picture is you can imagine, say, if the orderly, and this is what I've seen potentially unfold in some countries, where the orderly is now trained up or given some extra training to do some of the anaesthetic assistance, and then they're frequently relied upon to provide that assistance, almost to the point that, say, the primary anaesthetist might leave the room, go get a cup of tea, leaving the orderly in charge. And because they're potentially in such a vulnerable position in the sort of pecking order of the hospital hierarchy, they're given so much more responsibility, but they're not remunerated or respected for that. So I can see that in some countries where this is quite a complex situation, that motto of all education is great suddenly takes a bit of a backseat to the local politics. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. And hospital hierarchies will always let you know. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's one of the more complex things, which is I think where the people who are doing the ODEC work will know the countries and the hospitals that they're working in and that's what they're there for. They're great at navigating the politics. Yeah, that's why I asked Andrew, is there an anaesthetic nurse role or anaesthetic assistant role? It doesn't have to necessarily have to be an anaesthetic nurse. I think that the starter course, anyone can do the starter course and then go from their current level of knowledge to, I guess, a fairly safe level of knowledge. But if there's no role, that becomes a bit tricky. I've written you a checklist here somewhere about what I would need, I think, from a region. And it would be you need to have a central person who can distribute the information to each area. Mm-hmm. And so in this case, it was Andrew nominated someone for me mm-hmm. because you still need to provide the access somehow. And then it needs to be an area where English is spoken reasonably well and they could understand an Australian talking on a camera. And then they've got access to the internet. And I guess the grey area becomes whether they utilise an anaesthetic assistant. Mm. Um, but if you tick all those boxes, I think any region can do it. Yeah. Um, and please with Namibia, we engaged the Namibian Society of Anesthesiologists and and asked about CPD accreditation because that was one of the questions that kept coming through from the Namibian learners. And so we applied and went through quite a rigorous process actually, and they came back and accredited us with with CPD. That's great. And so now our certificate for them includes the NSA logo and the CPD credits, and I think it's a better option for them now to do it because it's worthwhile. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think you asked all the right questions at the start of Andrew which has then made it a lot easier with the rollout. And I think you've just established it within the right governance over there, which is just fantastic. Well, credit to the Namibian Society of Anesthesiologists for having this pretty good oversight of the education and what they expect from the anesthetic assistants, because as we know, that safety profile of anesthesia is a lot to do with the anesthetic assistant and that dynamic. For sure. It sounds like over the last year and a half, it's just been this incredible journey of learning and growth for you. Things like Instagram, developing online courses, navigating batch emails, all those sorts of things. What do you think has been the funnest part of it all for you? I think the the days when an, an anaesthetic nurse walks into my theatre who's done the course and to work with me and I can just see that they've got this confidence and I don't know whether that's because I, maybe I've had a bit to do with them or but they're confident about getting a plan from me, they're confident about airway management and, and using the anaesthetic machine, that sort of thing. And I think that's, that's really rewarding when you see that because it, it should be a fun relationship. Um, the anaesthetic assistant and the anaesthetist. So I think that's probably been the best part of it. Lovely. And what do you think have been the biggest challenges along the way? Selling myself. I think it's a very unnatural thing to do. I hate that. I really struggle with the concept of trying to sell someone something. And Totally get that. But in a business, it has to be done and you have to work out why that person needs it and how it brings them value. Yeah, I, mean, all, I guess in addition to that, probably the time has been a lot more than I expected to create the courses, but the outcome's worth it. I totally agree with you. To me, you're not coming across as selling yourself, but I know when I've been in a similar position, I've been like, gosh, I feel like I'm a salesperson. <laughs> I, yeah, it doesn't feel... Right. It's not something we've ever had to do in medicine, I don't think. True. And even anaesthesia, you don't have to sell yourself to the patients. So it's very unnatural. True. I agree. Well, you're doing a great job. I don't think you're out power selling or anything like that. You're doing a great Thanks, job. Susie. <laughs> and there's been this incredible, as I said, growth in the last year and a half, year particularly. What do you think the future will hold? We talk about the anaesthetic assistant advance course in our starter course, and that's because I had to be very careful of what information I selected was going to go into the starter course. So uh, ultimately, the anaesthetic assistant advance course, which will be targeting experienced anaesthetic nurses and trying to really hone those skills that are infrequent but still important, that would be probably a 2024 job. I've had quite a few people requesting that to be escalated a little bit because they're ready to do it, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, the nurse cannulation course that I mentioned will be the next thing released. But I think our next step is going to be really engaging with hospitals, which is becoming easier because the awareness of what we do is improving and we're getting a bit more backing from governing bodies, which is giving us a bit more drive. So I think approaching hospitals will be next. And then, as we mentioned, the global outreach component, which I think will be a really rewarding part. Yeah, definitely. When I'm often asked a similar question, you know, you know what it sounds like. And I joke about this world domination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yep. First I, first the nurses, then the hospitals, then the world. <laughs> I want to see I want to see billboards and car stickers and <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Will you be doing it in the advanced course? I'm only asking selfishly because I do a lot of peds. I do a lot of max facts. I do a lot of peds max facts or dental, so a lot of nasal tubes, a lot of very subspecialty things. And you mentioned before you do a lot of paediatric ENT. So will the advanced course be looking at more of those subspecialty areas? Yeah, exactly. So I think it'll be those subspecialty areas that in some hospitals, anaesthetic nurses will be thrown into infrequently, which is quite scary for people. So like neuro, peds, airways, shared airway stuff. But also just things that need a good shared plan, like prone positioning or mm. awake fiber optic intubation or those sorts of things. So I probably shouldn't say too much because I have to then make a list of actually have to come through with all <laughs> exactly. these topics. <laughs> we'll hold you to it. <laughs> so Jack said on the podcast he was going to do this. <laughs> that's right. Now we're all waiting for the awake fiber optic module. So. <laughs> oh, that sounds really good. I can't believe how wonderful this project is. It has come at the perfect time. I've definitely been working with a lot of new anesthesia nurses who still have a lot to learn and are doing a great job with the time and the resources they have already. And I just really wish you all the best with it. I think your world domination is not too unrealistic. (laughs) Thanks, Susie. I really appreciate the support. Well, I hope you enjoyed getting a behind the scenes peek at Periop Concepts and getting to know Jack a little better. Thank you, Jack, for creating this resource and also letting the ASA endorse it. I am constantly being blown away by some of the talents amongst the anaesthetists of Australia. We at the Australian Society of Anaesthetists have been gathering them together on our Innovations and Inventions webpage. On that page, you'll see books, software and medical devices that have all been developed independently by members of the ASA. I encourage you to visit it and have a closer look. We have some talented peers. Also, you would have heard Jack and I discuss ODEC. That stands for the Overseas Development and Education Committee. That is the committee that oversees the many global outreach activities of the ASA. It's something I'm really passionate about and I'm really grateful to the ASA for its support. What I see in common with innovating, inventing and undertaking work in global health is that they give people a sense of purpose, a sense of value of contributing to the greater good. Of course, some people find their purpose in other ways. We are all wired a little bit differently. But if you do have an innovation or invention that you'd like to share on the podcast, or if you are interested in getting involved with one of the ASA's global health projects, then please do reach out to me. There are multiple ways to contact me, but by far the best way is via email, and that email is podcast at asa.org.au. Of course, I'll put links to everything I have mentioned in the show notes. Okay, I hope you are finding fulfillment, purpose and value in your life, that you are getting great anaesthetic assistance and as always, that you and your team are staying safe and well out there. Thank you for listening to the Australian Anesthesia Podcast, which can be found on all the major podcast hosting platforms as well as YouTube. This podcast is produced by the Australian Society of Anaesthetists and hosted by Dr. Susie New with music created by Dr. Mark Seuss. The ASA was formed in 1934 and our vision is for every anaesthetist in Australia to be at their best, providing the highest quality anaesthesia and perioperative care through excellent technical and non-technical skills. We also hope that this means that you are functioning at your best when you're away from work. In this podcast, we have conversations that seek to inform, challenge and inspire you to keep you performing at your best. Members of the ASA can access full versions of all episodes by logging into the ASA website at asa.org.au. If you are listening on your favourite podcast app, then make sure you look at the episode notes for the direct link to the podcast on the ASA website. Also, feel free to follow or subscribe so that you can receive the latest episodes as we do publish regularly. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email us on podcast at asa.org.au. Thank you for your time and we hope you enjoyed listening. Mm -hmm.